The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hello and welcome to Namibia's Endless Horizons Media Familiarization Webinar. My name is Terry Levine, and I'm calling from uh, Namibia, the Namibia Tourism Board's New York office. Um, just to give you a brief rundown of our agenda, we'll be running through an overview of Namibia. Then we'll be walking through an iconic itinerary with Craig Deal and Jeannie Fandora of Travel Beyond and Rob Moffat of Wilderness Seminars, uh, Wilderness Safari. And then finally, we'll walk through some story angles and open it up for questions. So first, I wanted to introduce everyone to the Namibia Tourism Board North America North American Office Public Relations Team. We have myself on the right, um, as well as Malcolm Griffiths and Carol Lee Barnes. And so to kick it off, we just wanted to give a brief overview of sort of where Namibia is located. So Namibia is located in southwestern Africa. Its capital and largest city is Bintuk, and its terrain varies from coastal desert to semi-arid mountains to plateau. And it borders Angola and Zambia to the north, South Africa to the south, and Botswana to the east. <clears throat> Namibia is actually quite large um, by, by American standards. It's actually the size of Texas and Louisiana combined. Yet it has a population of a little bit more than 2.2 million, which makes it the second lowest population makes it have the second lowest population density after Mongolia. Um, it's a republic, and it's a multi-party democracy with a five-year term president. And in 2009, the GDP was $9.4 billion. Some other facts that are good to know, Namibia's official language is English, and its currency is the Namibian dollar. Um, and for the tourism industry, tourism is a rapidly growing sector and generator of employment in Namibia. Moving on to the slide sort of showing how you can get to Namibia, there are many different cities that you can fly through in Europe, and there are many different carriers, including Air Namibia, British Airways, and South African Airways. Interestingly, for Air Namibia, which you see here as having a flight from Frankfurt to Vintuk, they've actually just recently developed a partnership with uh, Delta Airways, um, which connects Atlanta and New York through Accra, Ghana. Uh, with British Airways and South African Airways, we see that you can easily connect from New York and Heathrow through Johannesburg in order to get to Vintuk. And now I would like to introduce you to Craig Beal and Jeannie Fandora of Travel Beyond, who will be walking us through this iconic Namibian itinerary. Uh, Craig and Jeannie, if you maybe want to give the participants a little bit of background on yourself, that would be great. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I'm sure they okay. Um, my name's Craig Beal. I'm the CEO and owner of Travel Beyond. We were the uh, first company in the U.S. to plan safaris to southern Africa since 1975. Um, I bought the company from my mom who had founded the business. And uh, I'll introduce Jeannie in a moment. Um, Jeannie, Jeannie Pandora is one of, our, uh, one of our senior safari consultants. She's been with Travel Beyond since the middle of last year, but she was, uh, before that she was with Cox and King for over 11 years where she was their Africa program manager. Um, Jeannie has traveled to Namibia and Africa many, many times. Um, and, uh, and uh, serves as a safari consultant here at Travel Beyond. All right. Jeannie, a word about yourself? Hi, I'm Jeannie, and as Craig said, I've been in the business for about 12 years now, working with both East and Southern Africa, but Namibia was actually my very first safari destination ever in April 2000. And it's a country that offers something quite different, and it's very unique in its offerings. Um, and we'll get into that a bit more 
in detail with the itinerary we're going to go through and some of the areas that we'll review. But if you have any questions at all, I'm very well versed with itiner itineraries in Namibia and a lot of the different unique selling points of Namibia as a destination. So I look forward to introducing Namibia to all our participants. Thanks, guys. And um, unfortunately, Rob's not able to uh, call in at this point. So Craig and Jeannie will sort of run through our iconic Namibia itinerary um, together. So let's kick it off with the first day. <clears throat> All right. Um, most flights, no matter where you're coming from, are going to get you to uh, Namibia in the morning with a few getting you there in the afternoon. Um, typically, once you arrive in Vintuk, and assuming you've arrived on, the day you, on this day, day one, you'll take a scheduled light aircraft transfer, which is usually a single engine, single pilot Cessna, and you would fly to the Sasas Flayed Desert. Um, here on this iconic trip, we are, we're using a lodge called Kulala Desert Lodge. This is a, a, a chain of lodges owned by Wilderness Safaris, um, which Rob represents. And uh, Kulala is a, what's called a Wilderness Adventure Camp, which is their most basic permanent camp. These are typically about 450 square feet, very functional, very economical for uh, the travelers, and uh, you know, ensuite bathrooms and everything. Um, and what happens, you take about a two-hour flight to Sasi's Flight, you land, you get transferred to the lodge, and then that afternoon you'll immediately start your activities. And some of the main activities in Sasi's play, um, or the biggest attractions, are going to be, you know, sunrises and sunsets against this stunning, you know, background where the largest sand dunes on Earth are right there at your foot at your doorstep. Um, other things you can do there, obviously, game drives. There's not the big five here, but a lot of, a lot of desert adapted animals do do live in this area, and um, the main predators here are hyenas. Um, a lot of, uh, you can do hiking activities, you can climb up the dunes, um, you can also do some, do actual walking, um, not on the sand, you can do nature walks here. A lot of people do choose to do hot air ballooning, which takes place at sunrise, and typically this is where people get some of the best photography of their entire trip to Africa will be on that hot air balloon trip, and often that will end at a nice, uh, a nice breakfast out in the, out in the wilderness, and you're by yourself with your traveling companions and uh, having, having this breakfast. Um, if you look at the map, um, or if you remember the map that w Terry showed at the beginning, one thing you will notice is Namibia is just like the Atacama Desert and the west coast of Australia, one of those three places on Earth where you have a, a desert pushed up against a cold, uh, cold ocean environment, and that's important for, for the life-sustaining water, because even though you're in a desert, the, the water is so cold from the ocean that you get a fog every morning that actually brings life to this area. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. If you can get advanced to day two. Oh, sure. And we have Rob Moffitt joining us actually now on the phone too. So that's just a recent development. Hi, Rob. Hi, Terry. Hi, everybody. Hi, Craig. Hi, Rob. Good to be here. Right. Sorry, got some connectivity. And sorry to no interrupt. Go ahead, Craig. No problem, yes, and I've, and I've already kind of covered on the last slide what you can do um, for activities in Sasis Flay. Uh, but one thing that's really important about Africa and, you know, one of the most important aspects of your safari experience altogether is going to be your guide. And this, you know, with wilderness safaris, the guides are often, they're from the local community and that's part of their, part of their sustainable tourism initiatives is to have the guide be, be local people, but you really form a bond with your guide and, and you know, usually he, he's going to know so many things about, you know, every little thing you see. And in this case, he's obviously talking to some of the uh, some of his clients about a tree. And maybe that tree has medicinal value. Maybe it has, um, you know, some quality that can produce, you know, a, a spice. You know, just for example, not not in the case here. But uh, you know, just and he's he's with you the entire time, and you really form a bond. And when you come back from Africa, a lot of times people remember a person being a guide more than more than even what the name of the camp they were at. All right, so let's move on to day three. Um, on day three, you know, after usually after a morning activity, you'll have your normal morning activity, and a lot of times, like I mentioned before, people will do the balloon ride on their last day in Saucy's Flay. You'll once again board a light aircraft, and you'll take a scenic flight to Swakopmund. Um, on that scenic flight, hopefully you'll be able to fly along the coast and, you know, where the ocean meets the sand, and also possibly see the Edward Bolam shipwreck, um, and just vast, a 
vast desert landscape, and people get also can get good photography from photography from the air. Um, you'll land in Swakopmund, and I'll have Jeannie talk a little bit about the next two places on this iconic trip. In Swakopmund, can you just go back to the prior slide, Terry, sure. for one second? Sorry. So Swakopmund's a really interesting town, and it's something, it's a place where you certainly don't feel like you're in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's a very German town. There's a lot of German descendants that live in that area, just going back to the colonial days and the history of Namibia. So it's quite an interesting place to sort of have a break. And although we've created this iconic itinerary, we do specialize in custom trips, and we can really organize the best suited trip for a client, depending on what experience they're looking for, what their budget is, and how long they have to travel. Uh, I've included Swakopmund in this itinerary because, as Craig mentioned, it allows us to have clients fly over the Skeleton Coast and see the very iconic and historic Edward Bolin shipwreck, which is massive. You could see it even flying from the air. It's, it's very, very big, sort of beached, huge ship on the coast. In Swakopmund, some of the activities that you can also do are uh, sandboarding on the dunes and quad biking on the dunes, which is also available down in Fossil Place. So Namibia is also a really great destination, especially when it's also being paired with other destinations in southern Africa, because it offers activities that many of its neighbors do not, because of the landscape um, and the terrain. So then moving on from Swakopmund, we would have, from Swakopmund you take you have the Skeleton Coast Safari aircraft meet you at the Swakopmund Airport, and then you continue along the Skeleton Coast, flying north to the Skeleton Coast Safari Camp, which is a wilderness safari camp also. It's a classic camp, and there on the Skeleton Coast, Wilderness offers three night departures every that start every Wednesday weekly, and there are also four night departures every Saturday. I find that with a lot of Americans, they don't have as much time to travel. We don't have as much vacation time as people around the world. So often the three-night departures tend to be the preference. It still gives people two full days in the Skeleton Coast. And here you just have some images from the Skeleton Coast. The camp itself doesn't sit right on the coast, but it's not a very far drive. So moving on to the next slide to go through a bit of the some of the activities. Generally, on a three-day, on a three-night Skeleton Coast Safari, you would spend one day inland. So you, there you would visit the local Himba tribe at Puros, which is a very small village just outside of the National Park. And the Himba are one of the last truly nomadic tribes living traditionally in Africa. They're incredibly interesting. They're pastoralists. And to me, it's quite fascinating that they can have sheep and, and cattle in this very, very arid environment with very little water. Um, somehow they managed to eke out an existence for themselves and their livestock. So vid visiting the village is incredibly interesting. And as Craig mentioned, most of the guides are local. Most of them have some sort of a relationship with the Himba. They can speak the language. So you have this incredible liaison through your local guide from the Skeleton to Safari Camp, where rather than just going to a village and taking pictures, you can actually interact with the residents of the Himba village and ask questions and just learn more about a culture which is very, very different, obviously, to our culture here in the West. So it's quite an insightful experience and something also, again, very different from what I think you would experience elsewhere in Southern Africa, where a lot of the wildlife areas are either pretty far removed from local populations or if you do experience, quote unquote, culture, sometimes it may be very contrived. This is certainly not that sort of experience. The Himba are living as they do and as they have for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and they do so by choice. They're not putting on a show. This is actually where they live. So it's a, it's a great relationship that this that Wilderness Faris and the Skeleton Coast Camp and the staff have with this local village. And it's a great opportunity um, to, to experience incredible cultural in, in Namibia. Also on this day, you search for some of the wildlife in the area. For example, the desert elephant that tend to be a bit different. They're a bit smaller. Again, these are all desert-adapted species. There are lion in this area. There's giraffe. 
And it's incredible to see this wildlife, just like the picture up on the left-hand side where you have the elephant with that incredible desert scenery in the background. Uh, so it's a really interesting day to see what the Skeleton Coast is all about, that area, the culture, and the wildlife that lives there with, again, spectacular backdrops and scenery. There's also meerkat in the area, uh, which have become quite popular animals uh, due to the show Meerkat Manor. They're not as habituated as they are in other areas, but you can still see them, um, sometimes scurrying back to their bur burrows, but nonetheless, they are there. And so after spending time with the Himba in the morning, spending some time looking for the wildlife, you generally have a picnic out under one of the trees, one of the acacia trees in the area, um, before returning to camp later in the afternoon to relax and freshen up before dinner. And again, this is a little bit different from how game viewing is done in other parts of Africa where you normally go out early morning, you come back to camp for a few hours of downtime, and then you go back out in the afternoon. At the Skeleton Coast, you normally spend the whole day out in the park exploring and then come back to camp later in the day, so you really take full advantage of the day and your time there. So moving on to day six, Friday, which would be a Friday on the three night departures. The next day, you generally then go and experience something that's a complete contrast to the prior day by going out to the coast. And here, there's a picture of the Cape fur seals, but normally the seal, the huge Cape fur seal, the Cape cross fur seal colony is visited on the four-day departure, not the three-day departure, um, as it's quite a long day trip to, to get to the seal colony. However, you go out to the coast, and again, there's some very historic, there's some plane wreckage on the beach. There's two beach tugboats um, that are kind of right where the waves break. There's a very historic grave site. This area has a lot of interesting history dating back to World War I. Um, and so you explore this with your guide. Again, all the guides are incredibly knowledgeable. They're like walking encyclopedias about the area and the history. Um, and there is opportunity to see wildlife along the way and learn more about the desert. Here again, you have a picnic lunch out in the open on the beach. It's actually one of the best experiences I think you can have in Namibia to have a picnic lunch on the beach. And then you come back to camp again in the afternoon after a rewarding day out on the coast, on the skeleton coast. And on to day seven, and I'll let Craig take over from here. All right. Well, after your final, thanks, Jeannie. That was great. Um, and just to emphasize again, the, the Himba people who I've actually also interacted with in Namibia are, in my experience, and this is 29 trips to Africa, they're living the closest to the way they lived before European settlers arrived of any people in a safe, accessible area of Africa. So it, it, it's very, very unique. Um, so after the Skeleton Coast, uh, usually with a connecting flight, you'll fly to the uh, area adjacent to the Atosha National Park. And this is the Angaba Reserve, where Wilderness Safaris has a private concession. And like I said, just like the, uh, maybe like the Sabi Sands in South Africa, where Mala Mala and Singida is, um, you know, that's adjacent to the Kruger National Park. This is adjacent to the Atosha. So you have all the benefits of the park, but you're on private land, and you get a lot more benefits with that. And here, Wilderness Safaris has a classic camp. And um, as I said earlier, the, uh, the lodge in uh, Kulala Desert Lodge in Sasasfle, that was what's called a wilderness adventure camp. Um, a classic camp is a little bit nicer. It's going to be, you know, as far as amenities go, um, it's going to be about 650 square feet. You're always going to have indoor, you know, which means the roof is over it, indoor toilet, indoor shower, and, you know, a desk, a chair, and usually two big beds or maybe two big beds pushed together if the guests want that. Um, so you come to an Angava tented camp, and typically because of the timing of the day, you're going to do the afternoon activity inside the Angaba Private Reserve. And that will be a game drive. It could be um, a hike um, and then back to the camp for dinner. And the neat thing about Angaba Tented Camp is you do have a, a nice water hole right in front of the common area where the lounge and dining area is. And the water hole is very active at night, especially during the drier seasons, um, our summer, their winter. And, you know, good wildlife activity, rhino coming right up to the water hole. Um, so on day eight, which would be Sunday, you'd, there's a lot of options this day. Being adjacent to the Atosha National Park and also the Anderson Gate, it's very convenient to do a, a full-day game drive in the Atosha National Park. And so Wilderness Safaris will pack a picnic lunch, and you can head into the park and do 
either a full day game drive or maybe you just want to do the morning game drive. It'll depend on the guests and what they want to do. You can see the Atosha National Park, which is Namibia's best big four wildlife area. Um, they don't usually have buffalo there, but you know the rhino and the lions and the elephants, everything, everything in the Atosha. It's an abundant wildlife area. Um, and once you're done, back to uh, by sunrise or sunset, you have to be out of the park. Back to Angava, um, maybe a night drive, maybe uh, just time around the the water hole again, enjoying dinner and cocktails, and then up the next morning on Monday. You can do a, maybe a white rhino walk here where you'll approach on foot and you know under the safe guidance of your, your guides and trackers, um, approaching white rhino, or maybe you just have another game drive. And we're on Monday now, so if you can advance to day 10, um, that's your last morning. And typically people will fly. They'll, they'll fly out of Angava and go straight to Vintook and depart for Johannesburg that afternoon, that same afternoon. Maybe they're continuing on to South Africa or maybe they're flying to Cape Town. If not, there's lots of nice hotels in Bintook where you can spend the night, the Olive Grove Guest House or the Hotel Heinitzburg Castle, which is a Relay and Chateau property. Very nice uh, properties. And you know, people like to have a city tour and maybe a good dinner in, uh, in the city. It's Bintook, everything you'd expect of a, a modernized uh, African capital city in a, in a relatively prosperous country. Um, Next, I'd like to introduce Rob. He came on a little bit late because of uh, typical uh, African connectivity issues, but he's glad we're here. He's here. Rob works for Wilderness Safaris, which is a company Travel Beyond has worked with since their beginning in 1984 when they opened Mambo Camp. Um, Wilderness Safaris is first and foremost a conservation company. I know Rob personally, and so does Jeannie, as he stayed in our home, my home here in Minnesota, and presented to our clients both here and at an event in Los Angeles and Beverly Hills last year. So Rob, why don't you uh, talk about, why don't you take it over from here? Joining us from the Super, thank Super. Greetings all. Thank you, Craig. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Terry. Hi. Rob, do you maybe just want to give a, a couple uh, sentences to the group on your background with wilderness? Certainly. What do you do for wilderness? Um, thank you, Terry. I'm responsible. My name's Rob, Rob Moffat, and I'm responsible for the sales and marketing of the Namibia business. I'm based here out of Vintuk in the center of the country. We have a central office that services several different destinations, camps, and also uh, an air wing with small Cessnas to get you to these really remote parts. And we've uh, learned a great deal over the, over the years, and thanks to super support from organizations like Travel, like Craig and Jeannie at Travel Beyond, we are in a fortune, fortunate position to be able to host some of the most epic and life-changing safaris in this neck of the woods. Um, Terry, if I could just maybe backtrack a little and a little bit of background about Namibia. Um, specifically, since we're talking to the media, I, I can't resist the opportunity to boast about our track record uh, since independence. Um, in these 21 years, we've seen the area under conservation of the land, the land surface area, um, a full doubling, 100% increase of the land area under conservation from 18 from 18% 18 in 1990. Today, we have 36% of the surface area of the country under some or other type of conservation, and a great deal of this has has resulted as a direct consequence of responsible safaris, responsible tourism, and I'm proud to say that Wilderness Safaris has played a significant role in this. Consistent with this increase in conservation area, the wildlife populations have boomed, and we've seen most extraordinary bounce back of Mother Nature, and the country is in absolute showroom condition, certainly aided and abetted by several seasons of above average rainfall, but take for instance just our black rhinoceros population. This is the the endangered desert adapted variety, the Dicerus bicornis bicornis, it alone over the same period, these 21 years, has no less than tripled, 300% increase in its population in Namibia. It's an extraordinary achievement, particularly when you consider the, 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 the ravages that uh, neighboring and elsewhere rhinoceros populations face at this time, whereas Namibia is on the opposite trend. We're really proud of it, and responsible tourism has almost solely played a role in this and communities deriving direct benefits 
from responsible tourism upon their ancestral land. We're really proud of that. Terry, if you have any other thoughts, uh, you need to get me off my soapbox because I'm fairly proud of what's happening in our country. That was great to hear. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, and so we have about um, five minutes left. Um, and so we wanted to sort of go through a couple um, story ideas. And then also at the end, we'll open it up for questions. And so um, participants, you can type in um, questions using your function um, in GoToWebinar system. And then we'll sort of read out the questions after we go through these story ideas. So first, what's new in Namibia? We wanted to give you a little background on new hotels that open the new world hotel brand. And so uh, Namibia is the fourth largest nation in Africa, um, and but with 2.2 million has the lowest population densities in the world, as we've mentioned before. Despite its population, its small population, the country is seeing an infusion of luxury accommodation by well-known world accommodation brands. In July 2011, Switzerland-based Kempinski Hotels which expanded into Namibia in 2008, opened its second Namibian property, the Kempinski Midgard. Um, and also opening in July 2011, the Hilton Windhoek is the country's first five-star hotel. Moving on to the second um, story angle we have there, which on slide 10, on day 10, the day 10 slide, Craig mentioned the Camel Thorn Tours. Um, the Namibian government-funded Black Empowerment Enterprise Program provides Namibians tribes, Namibia's tribes with economic opportunities previously not available. It includes measures such as employment qual quality, skills development, ownership, management, and socioeconomic development. As tourism develops in Namibia, opportunities are opening up for new businesses owned and run by tribe members to cater to increased visitor arrivals. So that's speaking about the BEE uh, program. Next, um, we're talking about Namibia's unique wildlife at the Angaba Research Center, which the itinerary touched upon on the trip to Angaba. So Namibia's Angaba Research Reserve is home to some of the world's rarest and wildest animals. The Angaba Research Facility is a wildlife success story. 100 years ago, there were just 20 southern white rhino remaining in the wild, but today, Thanks to the efforts of ORC and other organizations, there are more than 15,000. Uh, community and conservation at the Damaraland Camp. Damaraland Camp is a successful resu result of a partnership between Wilderness Safaris and the Torah Conservancy. and has become an inspiration for communities and conservationists throughout Africa and beyond. The Damaraland Camp is now a benchmark for a world of ecotourism and in 2005, it won the World Travel and Tourism Council Tomorrow Conservation Award. And finally, to the survival of the desert adapted elephant, um, the Elephant Human Relations Aid uh, is a Namibian registered not for profit organization which runs an elephant conservation and volunteer project in Namibia. ER EHRA aims to find long-term sustainable solutions to the ever-growing problem of facilitating the peaceful cohabitation between subsistence farmers, community members, and desert-adapted elephants. The organization offers on tourism programs, educational programs on how humans can live alongside elephants, the elephant movement and identification uh, and data collection studies um, are one year that generate revenue for the organization. And so now we open it up for questions. So if everyone could just type in um, questions, we will read them out and see about um, see if our panelists can answer them. All right, we have our first question, um, and it states, tell me more about getting to Namibia from North America. So for that one, let me just advance back the presentation, hold on one second, to the slide on Namibia. Um, getting to Namibia. Okay, here we are. So as mentioned, um, Air Namibia is sort of the flagship, uh, flagship airline of Namibia. It's actually owned by the government. And you can connect through Frankfurt, um, 
from North America in order to get to Windhoek. And from Windhoek, uh, from Frankfurt to Windhoek, it's a direct flight. And you depart on the night, in the night, around 8 p.m. And then you arrive the next morning at 6. And as I mentioned earlier, the Delta partnership with Air Namibia allows for people coming from the United States to connect from Atlanta and New York going to Accra, which is a direct flight, and then from Accra going to Johannesburg, um, and I believe then took as well, which I, I will be able to check on. And then also, if looking here at um, British Airways, we see that folks from North America can connect through Heathrow, and then from Heathrow, they will go to um, they will go to Johannesburg, and from Johannesburg, they will go to Windhoek. And it's important to note that the uh, connection time between Johannesburg and Windhoek, there's uh, there's an ability to minimize that connection time. Um, and then finally, with South African Airways, you can connect from New York and Dulles, DC, to Johannesburg, and then from there, Johannesburg to Windhoek. You can Connect to um, you can connect to Vinta. Craig, um, how have people and visitors come in the past? What sort of um, airline accommodations do you guys provide for um, with Travel Beyond? Yeah, good question. Um, we find the vast majority of our travelers book. They'll either you know book with frequent flyer miles, or if they book with us, they're going to be flying on South African Airways or Delta. And but they don't use the Accra route because I think you know it's just not a it's not a, a comfortable route for a lot of people yet. And they're usually combining a trip to Namibia with a trip to South Africa. Um, so what the typical American will do is um, if they want to fly with Sky Team, which is Delta, they'll fly to Atlanta from anywhere in the U.S., take an evening flight to Johannesburg overnight, and then the next morning, Delta has no Sky Team partner in Southern Africa, so you fly British Airways, Air Namibia, or South African Airways, whichever one they want, on various flights in the morning to Vintook, getting there in time for the scheduled charter flights. Um, same thing for South African Airways. People will fly, especially from the New York market, they'll take that direct flight in the late morning from New York to Johannesburg and continue on to Vintook the same day, or possibly um, you know go to Cape Town first. Um, they can also take South African Airways from Washington Dulles, and um, uh, that lands in Johannesburg in the evening, and then they overnight and fly up the next morning. Um, and then, of course, all those flights, you know, people with people that want to go on South African Airways, we find a lot of clients in United markets like San Francisco, Denver, Chicago. They will book um, United flight uh, South African Airways with United Miles, or do upgradable tickets and fly, and ends up on the Star Alliance with South African Airways. And then the final thing is there's a lot of flights, or not a lot, but there's good flights from Cape Town to Vintook each day. And so people can be in Cape Town that morning, wake up and fly to Vintook, and be in Sasa's Flay by the evening. Let me know if that doesn't answer the question. That's great. And then we have another question here about um, what do visitors, do visitors normally um, just visit Namibia, or do they visit other um, countries when they're coming to um, when they're coming on a travel beyond trip. Gina, you want to answer that one? Sure. So a lot of people do combine Namibia with Botswana, which is a great combination just because they are there's huge contrast between those two countries. Namibia, of course, mostly desert. It's a very arid country. Um, lots of wide open spaces and you know, great culture and just beautiful dunes, the oldest desert in the world, the highest dunes in the world. Um, whereas in Botswana, you have the Okavango Delta, which is the largest inland delta in the world, has one of the densest populations of elephants in Africa, um, just an area teeming with wildlife. Um, but a lot of times, uh, that, that combination can be promoted sort of as a desert to delta type combo. Um, and it just offers people two completely different experiences. I mean, you almost feel like you land in Namibia and you're on one planet, and then you get on a plane and you land in Botswana, and even though it's the country just to its east, you may as well be on a completely different planet because it's just so different. Um, so that's a very popular combination. As Craig said, Namibia and South Africa are also a very popular combination, um, whether it's Cape Town and Namibia, or 
Cape Town and the Kruger area, or one of the private reserves outside of the Kruger National Park in South Africa and Namibia. It's the nice thing about Southern Africa, with Johannesburg being the gateway, you can really connect any of those countries. You can connect Namibia with Botswana, with Zambia, with Zimbabwe, with South Africa. You may have to fly in and out of Johannesburg, since it really is the main hub and gateway for Southern Africa. But you can really combine Namibia with any of the countries in Southern Africa, and it works very, very well. Um, and they're all quite different, because Namibia is really, again, that, that desert environment um, that's so unique. Great. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for right now. Um, just forwarding ahead to the contact information for um, Tourism Board and then also Travel Beyond and Wilderness Safari. Um, the session has actually been recorded, so we will send it around um, to all the participants on the line. Uh, similarly, we'll email everyone who called in with the presenter's contact details. And finally, we'll send a URL um, to follow up with everyone who's been listening for, with this presentation and more information on Namibia through the Namibia Tourism Board. So on behalf of myself, um, Travel Beyond, Wilderness Safaris, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedules to uh, be on this call. And we really appreciate it. And do not hesitate to contact any of us for more information on Namibia. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.